Muito bem, bom dia a todos, bom dia a todas, meu nome é Pablo Castanho, sou professor do Departamento de Psicologia Clínica da Universidade de São Paulo, é, coordenador do CLIGAP, que é o grupo de pesquisa clínica de grupos e instituições, abordagem psicanalítica, que integra também o LIPSIC, o Laboratório Interinstitucional é, de Estudos da Intersubjetividade e Psicanálise Contemporânea, que congrega docentes da PUC e da USP. Né? Estamos organizando esse evento com o Joel Cantor, Uh, Por que um grupalista? Por que um grupo de estudos que estuda grupos e instituições está dedicado à organização desse evento? Né? Primeiro, de um ponto de vista mais fortuito, tenho aqui Gustavo Vieira, que vai também me ajudar a coordenar essa sessão, e é meu doutorando. Gustavo Vieira, pode dizer um oi só para as pessoas te verem? Bom dia a todos, bom dia a todas. É publicamos juntos, né, Gustavo, um artigo na revista Cadernos de Psicanálise ano passado, que citava o trabalho do Joel, e ele nos encontrou pelo ResearchGate, entrou em contato e a gente começou a conversar e cá estamos, né. De fato, é, não somos, é, no nosso grupo de pesquisa estudiosos de Winnicott, como sei que muitos de vocês aqui hoje são, né, com profundidade, mas o Winnicott é um autor importante nas nossas referências, sobretudo, nas teorias psicanalíticas de grupo francesas, né, de Dianzier, René Caes, é, mas mais do que isso, como vocês vão ver hoje, a abordagem de Joel Cantor abre muito para a gente pensar o trabalho em instituições é, a partir do referencial inicotiano, né, e também a possibilidade de pensar que algo nas relações influencia a teorização e a produção psicanalítica, o que é um tema, desde o ponto de vista epistemológico, bastante caro, e discutido em alguns autores na nossa área, né? As relações de Freud e Fliess, Freud e Jung, e aqui, então, Claire e Donald Winnicott, como relações que também, do ponto de vista epistemológico, estão ligadas à produção que se dá. A sessão de hoje, ela ocorrerá do seguinte modo, né? Nós teremos uh, uma conferência do professor Joel Cantor, essa conferência vai ser dada em inglês, com um texto em português projetado na tela. Então, quem precisar de uma ajuda é, na língua, eu sugiro que esteja num computador com uma tela boa para poder acompanhar. Né? É, vão haver a, alguns vídeos, quatro vídeos, que estão legendados, né? e a, uma graphic novel também traduzida em português, que a gente é, vai apresentar junto com o trabalho. Né? Os vídeos, tem alguns vídeos que a legenda passa muito rápido. É para ter uma ideia geral, especialmente o vídeo de, de evacuação, depois ele vai retomar esse tema na fala dele, né? E vai ficar tudo no YouTube gravado, de modo que depois vocês podem, se tiverem interesse, voltar e ver com mais calma algumas coisas, né? Então, depois dessa fala, que deve durar por volta de uma hora e quinze, uma hora e vinte, a gente passa a palavra para o professor Gilberto Safra, que gentilmente se, uh, aceitou nosso convite para fazer comentários sobre a, a, a apresentação do Joel Cantor. Nesse momento, eu vou estar traduzindo no telefone para o Joe Cantor poder acompanhar, né? É, e uh, depois a gente abre para discussão. A discussão pode vir de perguntas desse Google Meets, que foram os convidados, os primeiros a se inscreverem, que foram convidados para estar aqui, né? Ou podem vir do YouTube. Nós temos a Marina, né? Oi, Marina, dá um oizinho. Oi, bom dia. E a Larissa. Larissa. Bom dia a todos. Que vão nos ajudar nessa intermediação com o chat do YouTube e representar as perguntas deles aqui. Há também, para quem tem interesse em ter o certificado como evento, a necessidade de fazer uma lista de presença, que é um Google Forms. Vou pedir para a Larissa, já pode pôr esse link, tanto no chat do YouTube, quanto no chat aqui do Google Meets. Esse, essa lista só fica aberta durante a apresentação, até às 11 horas. Depois ela fecha, não é mais possível ter acesso ao certificado. Tudo bem? É, então, o que for do português para o inglês, eu vou traduzir pelo telefone para o Canter. E o que for do, do que ele disser em inglês que não tiver escrito, eu vou traduzir consecutivamente ao português. Se eu cair, a Marina, que falou há pouco, me substitui nas, tradições, nas traduções e o Gustavo Vieira me substitui na coordenação da atividade, né? Ele também vai fazer a passagem do Joel Cantor para o Gilberto Safra, que eu vou estar preparando a conexão. Então, é, a gente tem agora, aqui no Google Meets, 44 pessoas, 
e 180 pessoas já nos assistindo no YouTube, né? Então, boa, bom dia a todos e todas, e é, eu vou, então, agora apresentar o professor Joel Cantor, e uh, com isso nós começamos os trabalhos. Então, Joel Cantor é um biógrafo de Claire, é o, o biógrafo, o grande biógrafo né, de Claire Winnicott, pioneiro do estudo do seu impacto na obra de Donald Winnicott, organizador da obra Face to Face with Children, The Life and the Work of Claire Winnicott, professor no Instituto for Clinical Social Worker, em Chicago, Illinois, nos Estados Unidos. Muito bem, então, um, é, um prazer é, tê-lo conosco, Joel Cantor. Vou pedir para o Gustavo já compartilhar a tela da, da conferência, Gustavo, do texto traduzido. Né? Vamos só aguardar essa entrada. Muito bem. So, Joel Cantor, uh, we're very happy to have you with us here today. I've already introduced you, so please, you may start uh, whenever you want. Um, Pablo, uh, I think I would like to begin with the graphic novel slides. Uh, and welcome to everybody. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be speaking to all of you in Brazil. Uh, I'm going to begin, and Pablo, you can translate this, with a short segment from a graphic novel uh, called Are You My Mother? And it was written by uh, Alison Bactel, uh, a very well-known graphic novelist in the United States. And um, she, uh, in part of her graphic novel, she tells stories about Winnicott and his ideas. And I don't know if we can are you able to see these. It just does not look clear enough that um, muito bem, é, então ele vai começar a apresentação é, com essa a graphic novel, né, da Battle, que é uma pessoa muito conhecida nos Estados Unidos, ganhou um prêmio para um show na Broadway, e uh, temos ela traduzida pela Companhia das Letras, então vamos apresentar aqui, eu vou apresentar em português, só estou com um probleminha porque ligou uma passagem automática, então eu vou tentar, eu vou ler em português, né, Durante a guerra, Winnicott ia de trem uma vez por semana a Oxfordshire para conversar com os funcionários dos albergues de crianças evacuadas. Foi onde conheceu uma assistente social chamada Claire Britton. Fazia parte do trabalho de Claire manter o vínculo entre as crianças e os pais. Ela ia a Londres regularmente e fazia de tudo para encontrar as pessoas. Você viu minha mãe, moça? Ela transmitia mensagens, presentes, às vezes descobria que um pai ou uma mãe havia morrido. Claire também virou o vínculo entre o Winnicott e os funcionários, que apesar de gostarem dele, se frustravam porque ele não dizia como deviam agir. É só contar o que a gente fez e ouvir o que ele diz, assim a gente vai aprendendo. Claire tinha interesse por análise e queria muito falar com Donald sobre suas ideias. Boa noite, Dr. Winnicott. Perdeu o trem? Teve início uma colaboração intensa que moldaria o restante de ambas as carreiras. Claire acabaria tornando-se analista também. Donald estava na iminência de um incrível avanço teórico. Sim, sim, senhorita Britton. Vou passar essa noite aqui. Da parte de Claire, foi necessário várias, eh, dar várias deixas, sem falar em tantos anos, mas, enfim, eles, torna eles tornaram-se amantes. Tem um quarto no, no Mitri. A consumação talvez tenha ficado evidente num sonho em que ele dava sementes de girassol a Claire. Que coisa mais estranha de se fazer, não acha? Ele tinha 48 anos. Claire nunca engravida, engravidaria, mas é difícil imaginar um relacionamento mais produtivo. A mais autoconfiança na obra pós-guerra de Winnicott. Sua voz pessoal inspira seus escritos teóricos. Ele continuou com Alice e manteve o caso com Claire em segredo. Mas uma série de ataques cardíacos, enfim, convenceu-o de que a vida dupla iria levá-lo à morte. Depois do falecimento de seu pai, cada... Desculpa, deixa eu voltar aqui. 
Depois do falecimento de seu pai castrador, em 1949, ele finalmente conseguiu se separar de Alice. Não faz bem, estamos só magoando um ao outro. Essa é a capa em português para vocês conhecerem. Well, that summarizes my talk very quickly. Uh, and um, is, this book is not in Portuguese now, is it? Uh, uh, yes, it is in Portuguese now. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Um, anyhow, the, uh, the author uh, read, my, uh, read my book to uh, do uh, this part of her, of her graphic novel. You can... Great. É, então, esse, é, essa, isso sumariza, de certo modo, a conferência dele hoje. É, perguntou se estava traduzindo em português, né? comentei que está, pela Companhia das Letras, e é, que essa autora leu o livro dele. Né? Ele ficou sabendo depois. Ok. Então, so agora podemos começar o uh, meu formal talk com essa pequena summary. Uh, um, o título é Let's Never Ask Him What to Do, Claire Britton's Transformative Impact on Donald Winnicott. Do we need to put up the... Uh... Sure. Então, estamos agora começando a fala formal dele. Então, não well, traduz mais, estará escrito aqui, tá? Uh, well, the work of Donald Winnicott is well known to psychoanalysts. Most are unaware of his professional collaboration with his second wife, Claire Britton, a pioneering social worker who worked in child welfare, academia, government service, and psychoanalysis over the course of a remarkable career. Known largely for her accomplishments in compiling and editing her husband's papers, Claire Britton Winnicott was a creative and talented social worker and psychoanalyst who expanded her husband's horizons collaborating with him and exploring the interface between the psyche and environment. These qualities quickly impressed Donald Winnicott when they began working together with evacuated children in 1941, and a lively professional collaboration eventually evolved into a more personal relationship. In response to this wartime experience and his collaboration with Claire, Donald's approach to treating children and his scholarly contributions evolved dramatically. As the biographer Rodman noted, quote, during this relationship, which would continue the rest of his life, Winnicott became an entirely new kind of thinker and writer about the psychoanalytic understanding of human life. Similarly, in a 1946 letter to Claire, Donald wrote, quote, My work is really quite a lot associated with me, with you. Your effect on me is to make me keen and productive, and this is all the more awful, because when I'm cut off from you, I feel paralyzed for all action and originality. However, apart from the impact of their personal relationship, Claire and Donald's 30-year professional collaboration has largely been overlooked by Winnicott's biographers. In this talk, I will briefly review Claire's professional career before discussing her professional co collaboration with Donald and discuss several of her important contributions. Now, a little biography about Claire Britton Winnicott. She was born in 1906 in the north of England and was the oldest of four siblings in the home of a community-minded Baptist minister. After some early years working in YWCA's and youth ministries, she completed the social science course at the London School of Economics in 1938, before she took her first formal job, social work position, with troubled youth in a depression-ravaged town in Wales. After witnessing extreme poverty for several years, she returned to the London School of Economics where she completed their prestigious mental health course under work wartime circumstances in Cambridge in 1941. She then spent the war working in Oxfordshire, supervising five hostels or group residences for troubled evacuees who were unable to cope with routine placements in family homes, 
In this project, she worked alongside Donald Winnicott, who served as a psychiatric consultant on a one day per week basis. Claire and Donald's creative work with children during the war became known throughout Britain, and they emerged as leaders in a post-war movement to transform children's services. They co-authored two articles about their experience with evacuated children. One was titled, The Problem of Homeless Children, published in 1944, and the other entitled, Residential Management as Treatment for Difficult Children, was featured in the first issue of the journal Human Relations in 1947. Uh, and I should note, these are two of the only articles that uh, Winnicott co-authored with anybody. After the war, they offered joint testimony to the post-war commission that led to the establishment of a modern child welfare system throughout England. Claire was appointed head of a new course to train social workers in child welfare at the London School of Economics. In this position, which she held from 1947 to 1958, she trained many professional social workers in this emerging field. Although the exact details are unclear, Claire and Donald appeared to develop a deeply personal relationship during the war while Donald was still married to Alice, his first wife. Clearly, Donald had considerable conflict about leaving Alice, and he waited to do this until his father's death at age 93 in December 1948. Uh, he actually moved out about three weeks later after his father died. During the next several years, while divorce proceedings worked their way through the courts, Claire and Donald lived together for much of this time. They eventually married in 1951, several weeks after the divorce became final. Now, around 1950, she became a personal psychoanalysis with Clifford Scott, the first British analyst who was formally trained by Melanie Klein. After Scott moved to Canada in 1953, Claire became an, began an analysis with Melanie Klein herself. Most likely, Donald played a direct role in this referral. In 1956, Claire entered formal psychoanalytic training at the British Psychoanalytic Society. Her clinical supervisors included Michael Ballant, Herbert Rosenfeld, and Hannah Siegel. Her analysis with Klein was a difficult experience. While Claire had deep respect for many of Klein's ideas, she also found her distant and impersonal. She was very disappointed by Klein when she returned to her analysis after a life-threatening bout with meningitis. Claire told Klein what she had learned about her experience, uh, about what she had learned about trust from her experience with the caring nurses in the hospital. Klein responded, quote, this is simply a cover-up for your fear of death. Claire experiences this response is deeply unempathic. At another point, she stormed out of the analysis after Klein offered a 25-minute interpretation of a significant dream about her mother. Uh, Claire told a colleague that Donald had to call Klein personally in order to resume her analysis. And Donald told Claire that she, if she wanted to complete her analysis, she had to go back and kiss the ring. Claire was disappointed with both Kleinian technique and the Kleinian faction at the society. But with Donald serving as president of the society, she coped with intolerance of dissent within the Kleinian group by remaining largely silent in her classes and compliantly submitting to supervision by Orthodox Kleinians. Hannah Siegel, in fact, told me that Claire was a committed, actually a committed Kleinian who concealed her deep disagreements with her husband in order to pre preserve marital tranquility. However, Hannah Siegel was not aware that Claire directly expressed her concerns about Kleinian practice in both her lectures to social work students, as well as a paper published in a social work monograph where she only cited non-Kleinian analysts. Around the same time, Donald 
critically reviewed Klein's book, Envy and Gratitude, in a social work journal. I suspect both Claire and Donald thought that Klein would never learn about these publications. Claire's analysis with Klein continued until just before Klein's death in 1960. Just weeks before her death, Klein wrote the British Institute that Claire's analysis was complete and she was able to be certified as an analyst in the British society. In 1964, her career changed dramatically and she was appointed director of child care studies in the British government. In this position, she was responsible for the government's initiatives in training child welfare workers and administrators throughout the nation. Effectively lobbying for dramatic budget increases, she established programs to train thousands of workers. For her distinguished government service, she was awarded the Order of the British Empire in 1971. 1971 was a difficult year for her. Her husband, Donald, had died in January. Soon after facing retirement age, she left her government position as the social service bureaucracy was reorganized. Crippled with grief, she attempted to work, return to social work academia as chair of the social work department at the London School of Economics. She expected a comfortable tenure as a respected leader, but found herself embroiled in the intense generational and professional conflicts of that era. Unable to cope with these tensions in the midst of her grief, she moved on to a quieter life as a psychotherapist and psychoanalyst. Besides teaching and supervising therapists, she also organized a group of analysts to edit and publish her, her husband's voluminous writings. After suffering repeated operations for melanoma, she finally succumbed to this illness in 1984. Now, let me begin by discussing Claire's important work with Donald in Oxfordshire which changed both of their lives. Uh, it was perhaps the defining experience of their lives and careers. Before meeting each other, their respective professional talents emerged at a time when Britain was undergoing a dramatic change in both its cultural understanding of childhood and its government child welfare programs. Over 6 million people were evacuated from Britain's from Britain's cities to the countryside during the early years of the war, especially after the Blitz in 19, September of 1940. Families agonized about their separation. Should they put their child's physical safety ahead of their psychological needs for attachment? Fam fathers were off in the military and mothers were pressed into employment. Even with the massive evacuations, nearly 8,000 children were killed by the German bombing. So I'm gonna show a little video about the evacuation to help you understand the history.
I hope that gives you a little background about this. Uh, let me tell you a brief story uh, about the experience of one man who was actually a student of Claire's that he had as a, a, a vacuee, and Pablo can translate when I'm finished. Uh, this man, Alan, uh, I asked him about his experience. He said he spent his life in ten, his, the war in 10 different foster homes. I asked him why did this happen? He said he wet the bed and families did not have washing machines. So they were not happy with the child who wet the bed and they sent him from home to home. É, Joel contou uma história de uma das crianças, né? É, Ellen, se não me engano, mas um rapaz que passou em 10 casas né, de acolhimento, 10 casas, 10 famílias diferentes. Ele perguntou por que 10, né? Por que tantas casas? Ele falou porque ele, ele é, é, molhava a cama, tinha, né, fazia xixi na cama à noite e na época não existia máquina de lavar. Então as famílias não queriam uma criança assim. Thank you. So I'm going to continue uh, uh, with the paper. Uh, now these evacuees, uh, primarily lower class and working class children from the cities, were often unwelcomed in the middle class homes that were required to accept them. Many brought with them psychological problems from their homes, and even more developed difficulties when faced with long periods of parental separation and in some cases even death. Throughout England, rudimentary social services were created to serve the needs of these children. When home placements failed, hostels were established that could provide special care. The evacuation was a unique challenge for social work and psychoanalysis. Almost every family in Britain was touched by this experience in one way or the other, and the impact of the issues of attachment, loss, and separation could not be ignored by psychoanalysis. Although environmental factors in psychic development were acknowledged by some before the war, they could not be ignored as the war, as the war proceeded and impacted the thinking and practice of Bowlby, Anna Freud, and even Melanie Klein. And during this period, Winnicott and the other independent analysts emerged as significant voices within psychoanalysis. Unlike many of her fellow students from the prestigious London School of Economics, Claire deliberately avoided employment in child guidance clinics or mental hospitals. When she was out at a pub with her fellow students, she told them, I've enjoyed this course enormously but the last thing I'm going to be is a psychiatric social worker. I want to be in the hurly-burly of what's going on in the world. After she completed her training in 1941, Claire became, began working with evacuated children in, Oxford, in Oxfordshire, an assignment that changed the course of her life. In her position, her primarily re, primary responsibility involved the administrative and professional supervision of over 80 troubled evacuees who were housed in five hostels. Because of special problems, often behavioral, these children had not been able to achieve stable residence in the family homes they were assigned to. Donna Winnicott was a consulting psychiatrist to this program. He visited from London every Friday, but Claire retained the day-to-day -day responsibility. Now we're going to hear Claire tell her story about how she meets Donald. He couldn't avoid the problems thrown up by the vast disintegration of family life, a separation that went on, children sent away. Um, he had to face up. To, to the more difficult problems. And he knew when he took on the consultancy job for the government evacuation scheme, he knew that he was in for something quite different, a quite new experience for him. Um, so he became consultant psychiatrist to the, to the 
Oxfordshire area of, of reception area where children were sent from London. Um, he became consultant really to the five hostels that were set up to take the children who couldn't be placed in ordinary homes, ordinary families, because they were too difficult. Nobody could manage them. Uh, he hadn't been, he'd been in this job for a little while, about a year, I think. When I was, I was working then, I'd just finished the mental health course and I was working um, in, in Reading with the Minister of Health and suddenly I was told by my boss, there's a very difficult doctor in coming down every week um, to Oxfordshire hostels. Uh, He's very difficult, he doesn't like social workers, but you're to, and he's making a muddle of things, you're to go and sort things out. <coughs> and this was just told me. And we always, we very much like this introduction we had to each other. Um, so I just turned up, you know, routine, you do your job. Um, and I went, he was at one of the reception centres and I listened for a whole afternoon and saw things. And he was very suspicious of me and he said, I shan't want a lot of case histories from you. You know, social workers who take case histories. Um, and I thought, marvellous. Um, he said, I shall want observation. Can children play? Who do they play with? Can they be creative? Can they play on their own? Can they group? Can I want observations of what they're like. I don't want a lot of history. Looking at me very suspicious, not just say, you know, it's up to you. Can you do it? He came down once a week, and I would go around to whichever hostel he was at and listen and see what went on. And I could I gradually could see where I could contribute. Um, because people would say to, to, us, to, to me afterwards, you know, he never tells us what to do. And how he leaves us with these terrible children, we never know what to do. He never tells us what to do. Well, of course, you can imagine he never can tell them what to do. So I thought, how do we get round this one? And I said, well, look, don't you think he, he's always in London? He can't tell us what to do down here. He can't be the moment at which we've got to do something about something. So isn't it best if we do the best we can in the given circumstances, and then we think about it, and we tell him about it when he comes next time? and see what he says about it. Shall we try it that way round? And that really uh, did... Um, he always says I gave him a place in the scheme. Um, and I think it did, it, it did help a lot that we did it that way round. But, so, you see, staff were always looking to the doctor and must tell us what to do. He's the doctor, he's got to tell us what to do. But of course it couldn't be done that way in this kind of job. So it's my, I saw my role really as trying to help people to see that it couldn't be done that way. And that we got to find a way of using him as best we could. Well you can imagine that these sessions, when he came down every Friday and went round the, the group of hostels, we had 90 kids all together in the whole of them. Um, these sessions became tremendously important learning experiences for everybody, including him, you know, certainly me. And, and the star. Okay. So here you you get a chance to hear Claire's voice um, telling her own story. Now, she began working full-time with these children in Oxfordshire and um, and again, Donald visited only on Fridays as a consultant. Uh, and their jointly authored article, The Problems of Homeless Children, stated, quote, in practice, the social worker controls the whole of the work and is the one individual at the center of the scheme. Claire provided continuity to the hostel so the staff came and went, and she played a key role in the placement and transfer of children consulted regularly with hostel staff and was the only person who knew, quote, each child at every stage. Their co-author article continued along these lines and emphasized, quote, 
I'm quoting here, the social worker saw the child in his school and his billet, his home, and then in the hostel, and possibly in more than one hostel. If there is a change in hostel warders, it is a social worker who gives some feeling of stability during the period of change. She is also in contact with the child's home, visiting the parents whenever possible. And this is, I think, a very important sentence. She is thus able, in some degree, to gather together the separate threads of the child's life and to give him the opportunity of preserving something important to him from each stage of his experience. The social worker organizes the narrative of the child's life. Maybe you can translate that. Um, uh, Mr. Cho, that, that was on the text, wasn't it? No, it was not in the text. The, the social worker organizes the narrative of the child's life. I'm just adding that. Okay, great. É, o, o serviço social organiza a narrativa da, criança, da, da vida da criança. Okay. Now, in contrast, this article states that the psychiatrist's role, Winnicott's role, was limited to weekly consultation with the staff, occasional interviews with difficult children, and the provision of medical authorities in problematic situations. Years later, Claire wrote about their collaboration. She said, I saw my first task as trying to evolve a method of working with, working so that all of us, including Winnicott, could make the best use of his weekly visits. The staff living in the hostels were taking the full impact of the children's confusion and despair and the resultant behavior problems. The staff were demanding to be told what to do, and it took time for them to accept that Winnicott would not and in fact could not take on that role because he was not available and involved in the day-to-day -day living situations as they were. Gradually, it was recognized that all of us must take responsibility for doing the best we could with the individual children in the situations that arose. Then we would think about what we did and discuss it with Winnicott as honestly as we could. These sessions with him were the highlight of the week and were invaluable learning experiences for all, including Winnicott. His comments were nearly always in the form of questions which widened the discussion and never violated the vulnerability of individual members. After these sessions, Winnicott and I would try to work out what was going on from the massive detail that had been given to us, and we would form some tentative theories about it. Now, both these recollections and their jointly authored articles clearly delineated that Claire was the leader, had the leadership role in directing this work in the hostels, and that Donald had the secondary role as consultant. In no way could this relationship be described as one of clinical supervision. Claire's autonomous creativity emerges in several recollections of her work in Oxfordshire. The challenges of this work under chaotic wartime circumstances cannot be underestimated. Caseloads were large, resources were limited, and social work had no recognition in the community. Besides such mundane responsibilities as ordering supplies, Claire focused her efforts on consulting with the hostel staff to help them endure the strain of working with such difficult children. And we'll show another uh, video where Claire talks about her work. Do you have to unmute it? About, we didn't produce miracles, but we did um, help staff to work without fear to face situations, even pretty drastic ones, like, you know, setting fire to something, without too much fear and with compassion. I think that came into it. Why is this happening? How do I rescue so and so? We had all kinds of disasters, like the wrong staff being appointed and everybody running away one night. Everybody, everybody. <laughs> Uh, and I was 
the whole of the night driving around Oxfordshire <coughs> in my car with no, no lights, uh, no signposts, map reading with a torch. The police telling me where these kids were. The police was pick, were picking them up. Uh, some hair-raising things went on, but we survived them. And I think this is one of the things that Donald did help us all to do, to survive things, uh, and that something good could come out of it, at even the most awful crisis if we could survive it and carry on, not give up. You know, somebody rings me up in the morning and says, um, so-and-so is on the roof, and it was a very big hostel, tall building. So-and-so's on the roof. He's been there for the last hour. Do we get the fire brigade or what? So, you know, a decision's got to be made. Um, and I said, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm all for not getting the fire brigade. He'll come down by lunchtime. Uh, but I have to check this up. I ring up my clerk and say, what about it? I'm taking this risk. Are you going to back me up? Um, he might say, what would Winnicott say? So I said, well, there's, you, I can't get him on the phone anyway, so it's no good. You know, we've got to decide this. Um, but there are things like that happen. Okay. Now, one of the important things that Claire did to address the emotional needs of these children involved helping them maintain contact with their parents. And these children were terrified about the survival of their fathers in, their, in the military and the mothers who were sleeping in bomb shelters in London. It is no wonder that these children suffered from frequent nightmares and bedwetting. And let me again play a video uh, of Claire talking about this work. I think one thing I had learned um, was that the children who were in touch with their parents, whose parents wrote and visited, were in a much better state than the children who never heard anything from any, anybody. So one of the things I did there was to ask permission to go up to London and to try and find the parents whose addresses we got um, of the children who never heard from them. And I was taken on gradually full time into this Oxfordshire scheme. So I had more time to do that kind of thing. And I did do that. I spent several days, whenever I could get the day, up in London and I was allocated to WVS driver and we went round to the addresses we got. And we did find a lot of the parents. Often we found a completely bombed down, finished road. And uh, sometimes we could locate the parent in the rest centre, but not always. And some were killed, some were killed. And their children didn't know that? No. No. So what I did there was try and make a link between the parents. And actually, I got such a name for it that every time I appeared into a hostel, they would rush up and say, um, Miss, have you seen my mum? You know, when did you see my mum last? Yeah. Uh, and it was quite hard for them, and I had to say, I can't see your mum every week, you know, yeah. uh, only every, every now and again. But it did, it did awaken some parents to their own responsibility in regard to the children. Because I could say, look, he's missing you terribly. Yeah. What about a note? Let, give me something to take to him, or yeah. something like this. So I did work very hard to make the links between home. Um, and I think that was very much encouraged by Dr. Winnicott. Um, and the benefit of it was also seen by the staff. The staff realised it. Now, Besides forming the human linkage between ch children and parents, this story also reflects Claire's awareness of the psych psychic significance of certain objects that embody significant relationships. You know, give me something to take to him. 
she says. Here's the beginning of the thinking about the transitional object. Do you need to translate that? É, me dê alguma coisa para levá-lo, para levar para ele, né, para o seu filho. Aqui começaria a conceitualização do objeto transicional. Uh, again, off the paper, this has a lot of significance for therapy with children. Uh, in my training, the psychiatrist saw the children and the social workers saw the parents. And there was not a person, uh, one professional, who saw both the children and the parents. And now we begin to think that maybe that's valuable for the child in therapy to know that the therapist is, sees the parents and sees the child, and that has significance for them. E falando que isso é importante no tratamento de crianças, né? Que é, na formação dele, o psiquiatra via a criança e os assistentes sociais, os pais. E ninguém via os dois. E que agora se compreende que é importante para a criança né, saber, né, alguém que veja os dois e que é importante para a criança que isso aconteça. Ok, então eu vou voltar para o paper now. In her first solely authored article in 1945, entitled Children Who Cannot Play, Claire's clinical sensitivity and clarity of expression are also evident. And I should say here, uh, you know, that Claire had no training as a child therapist when she wrote this. A, a Claire não tinha uma formação como uma terapia, terapeuta de criança quando ela escreveu isso. In the early days of the evacuation, Claire is saying, I met a six-year-old boy who was the most completely cut-off child imaginable. He never spoke of his own accord, and he only answered questions reluctantly. For a short time at the beginning, he refused food. He was completely docile and inactive, and he walked about in a dazed fashion. He was incapable of learning anything in school, and play was out of the question. He simply sat and watched people. It was not surprising to learn that both his parents had been killed in the air raid shelter from which he had been rescued. Fortunately, he was put in a good foster home where the foster mother understood something of what he was going through. She became fond of him, but did not try and force herself on him. She let him go his own way at his own pace. After about 18 months, he began to respond and recover. His first efforts at play were pathetic, and he would look sheepish and give up if anyone noticed him. He played only when alone with the foster mother. When the little boy was out with other children in the village, when her own little boy was out with other children in the village, she would plan these occasions when time allowed and would sit with him knitting and or reading. He would play with bricks, stopping always when anyone came in. Gradually, the play became more complicated. And one day he actually built an air raid shelter and played out his parents' death, suddenly asking, Does it hurt to be killed? All this time, he had been grappling with the experience of his parents' death, and only when he felt secure enough with his foster mother, whom he had, when he had grown new roots in his environment, so to speak, could he face the fact of their death and let them go. This he was able to experience again and again through play till he had, had accepted it. Of course, this was not the free, happy play of a normal child. There was much anxiety and compulsion in it. The patience and fat tact of the foster mother cannot be too highly praised. She helped not only by her fondness for the child, but by a passive acceptance of him and his difficulties. Now, by the end of the war, Claire's capacity to integrate theory and practice was evident in this 1946 presentation about her work with the children in these hostels in Oxfordshire. And she, she wrote, all children who come into the hostel have very one important thing in common. That is the failure of their own homes or foster homes to tolerate them and their difficulties. 
For all these children, the critical point of breakdown has been reached, and they have been known the frightening experience of things having gone too far. Help has been sought and decisions made, and life as they have known it disintegrate. The point of breakdown may have been reached early or late in the child's experience. The home may have been disintegrated quickly at his first efforts to prove its worth, or have made stood up a great deal up to that point, and given much that the child needs. Each child has come a different way to the point of breakdown, and each story with its inextricable tangle of cause and effect is peculiarly the child's own. Of course, the important thing for the hostel is at which point in the child's emotional experience did the break occur. If it came early and the actual physical break is merely the climax to a series of failures, then the hostel not only has not only to start from scratch, but has to be able to deal with the failure as well. If the actual break occurred later in the child's experience, then the hostel must help the child to rediscover what is good in the past after meeting and dealing with this experience of failure. For some children, therefore, the actual break from home may be the last act of a tragedy, while for others it may be even a sign of growth and new hope. But before this point is reached, there is much suffering and difficulty to be endured by the child and the hostel staff. The first stage is reached, when the child children are sure enough of the hostel to transfer their home difficulties into hostile life. And thus they save their own homes and enable them to construct a perfect home in fantasy on a totally unreal level. Those of us who have worked in hostels are all familiar with these wonderful homes from which the child from which even the child from the worst background can create and will often run away to find. If the hostel can stand firm and allow the children to work through this stage, then gradually real relationships with hostel staff can be formed and slowly the child can build up ideas of home based on real experiences in the hostel. In these passages, themes emerge which are highlighted in Donald's later publications publications about transitional objects, acceptance of counter-transference responses, play inhibitions, the antisocial tendency, and the holding environment. While Donald certainly acquainted Claire with the fundamentals of object relations theory, she brought her own creative powers to this work in Oxfordshire and used aspects of this theory in a practice setting quite different from the analytic consulting room. Now, to talk about their work after the war. From 1947 to 1958, she directed the child care course at the London School of Economics uh, that trained social workers in Britain's emerging child welfare system. The curriculum included classes in child development, pediatrics, legal issues, and sociology. And Donald, too, taught in this program from its exception offering between 10 and 24 lectures annually to social work students until the year before his death. In contrast, he was allowed to teach only three classes annually at the British Psychoanalytic Society. Donald and Claire also traveled frequently across Britain, lecturing and teaching at many social work organizations. Perhaps uniquely in the world of psychoanalysis, Donald remained actively engaged with the social work profession, publishing in social work journals until shortly before his death. His identification with social work is perhaps best expressed in the following issue, in the following passage in the final issue of the social work journal case conference. And I think this was 1970, uh, one year before he died. And I'm gonna read his words. I would like to use this last chance to appear in case conference to give the bare bones of a sort of belief which I believe is a common denominator among social workers and psychotherapists. Whatever we do in social work is related to quite natural things that get done in childcare and in baby care. The difference is that in a professional setting which carries its own limitations 
and allows its own freedom within the framework. We do the same things that are done in childcare and we do nothing else. The central part of the theory of the emotional development of the human individual has to do with the earliest stages when dependence is very much a fact and adaptation to need is the main environmental function. In personal or in social illness, these early phenomena tend to reappear and demand new enactment in a professional setting. When the social worker is not able to see his work in terms of the natural evolution of the maturing child in the environment that has its own evolution relative to a child's personal growth, then the social worker has stepped outside his or her social work job. There may be friendship, teaching, authoritarian indoctrination, charity, vindictiveness, religious conversion, political transmutation, or pharmacological modification of a client's neurophysical apparatus. None of these things, however, is social work, which by definition is derived by direct route from an understanding of the emotional development of the human individual and the long steady climb out of absolute dependence and towards independence. I suppose this is a kind of faith, faith in human nature. It seems to me to have base value as a basic social work principle. So let's look now at Claire's impact on Donald's work. Teasing out their contributions to one another is an impossible task. Kay McDougall, a social work colleague, of both of them at the London School of Economics, and Pearl King, uh, who had been president of the British Psychoanalytic Society. They both used the same phrase and said that the Winnicott sparked each other off. Similarly, Marilyn Milner suggested that Claire's, quote, gifts of liveliness, her sense of fun, even mischievousness, combined with deep seriousness and met the same in Donald Winnicott and she undoubtedly had a great influence on his work. Now, one can get a flavor of this dialogue from this 1944 letter that Claire wrote to Donald when they were collaborating with evacuees in Oxfordshire. Uh, and I don't think uh, anyone has read this uh, letter aloud before. Uh, uh, should I translate? Briefly. Ele, ele acha que ninguém é, leu essa carta é, em voz alta antes. Uh, dear Dr. Winnicott, you, and you have to hear the humor in this, okay? E vocês têm que ouvir o humor que tem nela. Okay. I think you are very hard on people, and that means at the moment on me. Now, I don't mind that so much as I mind the fact that you seem so unaware of it. Sometimes... Your lack of imagination staggers me. I'm sure you've got no idea that I'm still angry with you from last Friday. Well, I am. I think something was definitely due to me after sweating in that report for Mrs. Volkov. It wasn't easy to take that material of yours and get it into something that it is least a whole. And I know that last Friday, I didn't want to commend or thank you to thank, commend or thank me for it. I would have loved criticism but I did want some real reaction to it and you owed it to me. And I wondered very much why I didn't get it. And yet I know you were tired and overworked and everything else and I'm willing to excuse you. While I was working on the report, I realized how much you have helped me to understand in these last three years. And I'm grateful to you so very much. So here and now I say thank you, especially thank you for being able to appreciate me as a person, for I know that you do go deep down. But that doesn't stop me from being angry just now, especially as I brought a heavy load of case files from Oxford for the commission committee report. Nor does it stop me from working to point out that working with you may be fun, etc. but it's not without snags, and I feel I pay heavily for every bit of fun I get. Obviously, this is so in every... At the work, it is what you demand of other people or are any way associated with you. You make heavy demands and don't forget it. That's all. I've had to learn to do without a lot of things in this job. 
Somehow I've managed after a faction. And with your help, I don't regret one minute of it. But for God's sakes, sometimes show you under, that you understand, if you do, which is doubtful. I don't know what you will think about this letter. And honestly, I don't care. Perhaps I have not spoken plainly enough. Do you want chapter and verse? Please write and tell me off if you feel like it. That would be real. And I can take it. You are not God to me, though. I, although I'm angry with God as well. One of the nicest and best people I have known died in the Radcliffe last week, young and very charming and quite irreplaceable. Guns are all the time here, aiming at the doodle bugs, the rockets. A lot came down in the sea, but it is nerve wracking while, while they are going over and being shot at. When I have stopped being angry at you, I should be glad that you and Mrs. Winnicott enjoyed last Wednesday and a good time was had by all. I swear this is not the cause of my being angry. And then I plan last Friday to say these things, Claire. Now the context of this letter suggests that the intimate nature of their relationship had not yet developed. Yet Claire was comfortable expressing herself with great directness to an older man who was certainly recognized as an important authority. Throughout Claire's writings, themes and language commonly associated with Donald's work emerged repeatedly. In some instances, her references clearly preceded his discussion of similar concepts. Notable example was her observations of transitional objects. During the war, as, as noted earlier, she traveled to London to seek out the parents of the children in the hospitals and ask them to prepare a note or, quote, give me something to take to them. Several years later, in a 1950 book chapter, she re described this in evocative detail, and I'm quoting her. The moment of uprooting is just when a skilled social worker is needed to see what a child clings to in the past is brought with him and accepted in a new environment. There are many stories which now, it is hoped, belong to another era of children clinging to their own clothes and being given an anesthetic to enable the clothes to be removed or favorite but filthy teddy bears and other possessions being taken away and burned. But these did not belong to the past, and something became damaged and lost when familiar things were taken away. These possessions stood for everything the child brought with him from the past, and he could not afford to lose so much. The following year, in May 1951, Donald presented his classic paper, Transitional and Transitional Objects and Transitional Ph Phenomena, to the British Psychoanalytic Society. Similarly, in this 1950 chapter, she also outlined many of the core ideas about delinquency that Donald would more fully articulate in his 1956 paper, The Antisocial Tendency. Claire writes, as a child care officer comes into the lives of these children, she must first be able to sort out the whole situation carefully until she finds the live bit from which new growth can come. For the live bit is the thing that the child is clinging to as the focus of his feelings. It may be hidden in a memory or a fantasy or a habit. It will certainly be at the point of tension. The delinquent act is in many cases an unconscious effort to deal with loss. The depression and grief of a child who has lost the loved parent shows that he is alive and dealing with his loss, and that with help, recovery is possible. Perhaps the most difficult children to help are those with nothing alive about them. Here is the only thing, here the only thing is to wait and watch for signs of life, encouraging the slightest effort which may be made, perhaps towards the possession of something, or a sudden desire to sit next to somebody special. Um, and I should say here uh, that this is this is all written before Claire it begins her training in psychoanalysis. You want 
Now I'm going to go uh, here. Um, continuing some years before Donald's discussion of holding, Claire emphasized the concept of holding in her 1954 paper entitled Casework Techniques in the Child Care Services, where she argued that social workers provide a reliable medium with wit when within which people can find themselves or that part of themselves which they are uncertain about. She wrote, we become, so to speak, a reliable environment, which is what they so much need, reliable in time and place, and we take trouble, great trouble to be where we have said we would be at the right time. We take deliberate trouble to remember all the details about the client's life, and not to confuse him with other cases. We can hold the idea of him in our relationship so that when he sees us, he can find that bit of himself which he has given us. This is conveyed by the way in which we remember details and know exactly where we had left him in the last interview. And not only do we hold a consistent idea of people, but we hold the difficult situation which brought the client to us by tolerating it until either he finds a way through it or tolerates it himself. If we can hold the painful experience, recognizing its importance, and not turning aside from it as the client relives it with us in talking about it, we can help him to have the courage to feel its full impact. Only as he can do that will his own natural healing processes be liberated. I have deliberately used the word hold in what I've been writing because while it includes acceptance of the client and what he gives us, it also includes what we do with what we accept. Now here, Claire see, seems clearly to introduce a concept that becomes fundamental to Donald's work. Winnicott did not make holding a central focus of a professional paper until he presented the theory of the infant parent-infant relationship in 1960. And in one version of this paper, he cited Claire's 1954 paper on this topic. Finally, Claire's work repeatedly conver conveys her awareness of countertransference responses to very difficult situations. Recognizing her own insecurities when facing the difficult challenges of the evacuation, she empathized with the helplessness, anxiety, and stress of the hospital's hostile staff on the front lines. She understood that such responses were part and parcel of the therapeutic process. Her recollection of her wartime experiences are replete with references to the experiences of herself and her colleagues, such as, we all went through hell. We all struggle with this mom. We got very disappointed. They were frightened stiff. Early on, even in Claire's angry letter to Donald, we observe her awareness of the feeling states of herself and her staff. Her self-awareness certainly foreshadowed Donald's classic paper, Hate and the Counter-Transference. And so conclude with some last thoughts about Donald and social work. Psychoanalytic scholars of Winnicott have rarely acknowledged his active participation in and identification with social work, even though he explicitly acknowledges in many papers. Donald's engagement with social work, largely facilitated by Claire, undoubtedly had a considerable impact on his thinking about clinical interventions. After his intensive pre-war experience as a child analyst, Donald rarely psychoanalyzed children after the war. Instead, his approach shifted dramatically toward a consultative approach with parents and other caregivers. This method was perhaps first outlined in his 1955 paper, A Case Managed at Home. This paper was originally published in a, in a social work journal called Case Conference, but was later included in his first collection of psychoanalytic papers. Susanna Elmhurst, a pediatrician psychoanalyst who worked closely with Donald 
at Paddington Green Hospital recalled that Donald and Claire, quote, developed in Oxfordshire unique experience and skill in devising and supporting environmental changes which nourish the emotional and physical growth of children. Out of this lively mutual cooperation involving various non-medical and often non-parent adults, they gradually, gradually developed Winnicott's Monday afternoons at the Green. Often using the term management, repeatedly, Donald repeatedly identified the advantages of social work intervention in working with severely troubled children and adults. In one passage, he noted the psychoanalyst is relatively impotent with severely disturbed patients unless, quote, he steps outside his role at appropriate moments and himself becomes a social worker. He added, quote, that psychiatrists and psychoanalysts constantly hand over cases to the care of the psychiatric social worker for no better reason that they can do nothing themselves. Through Claire, Donald became intimately involved with social work, both its theory and its practice. He spoke and wrote far more often to social workers and related groups than he did to psychoanalysts. And what he learned from Claire about the clarity of expression, one of her special gifts, enabled him to communicate with a far wider range of audiences than most psychoanalysts. In the David Wills lecture he gave, to the Association of Workers for Maladjust, Maladjusted Children in October 1970, just three months before his death, he reflected on the transforming impact on his career of his experiences with evacuated children. And I'm gonna quote his remarks at, at length. Uh, and I just think this is a wonderful passage. A great deal of growing is growing downward, downwards. If I live long enough, I hope I may dwindle and become small enough to get through the little hole to call dying. I do not need to go far to find an inflated psychotherapist. There's me. In the decade called the 30s, I was learning to be a psychoanalyst, and I could feel that with a little more training, a little more skill, and a little more luck, I could move mountains by making the right interpretations at the right moment. This would be called therapy, well worth the five a week sessions and the cost charged for this work and the disruption that the treatment of one member of a family can cause for the rest of the family. As my insight deepened, I found that like my colleagues, I could make significant shifts in patients' materials as presented in the treatment hours. I can induce greater hope and therefore bigger commitment and more and more unco valuable unconscious cooperation. And indeed, it was all very fine and dandy. And I plan to spend the rest of my professional life practicing psychotherapy. At one time, I could have been heard saying there is no therapy except on the basis of 50 minutes, five times a week, going on for as many years as necessary, done by a trained psychoanalyst. I have made this sound silly, but I don't mean it to be so. I simply mean that it's kind of that it's a, that's a kind of beginning, but sooner or later the kind of growing smaller starts, and it's painful at first, till you get used to it. For me, I think I'd started to grow smaller at the time of my first contact with David Wills during the war, of course. David will not let himself be proud of his work in an old poor law institution in Beechester. It was notable work and I am proud for him. It was exciting to be involved with the life of this wartime hostel for evacuation failures. Naturally, it collected the most unmanageable boys in the area. In the area. And a familiar sound was like this. A car would drive up at some speed the bell pole would start a clatter of bells. Someone would open the front door. The door would bang to the accompaniment of a car whose engine had been left running, making off as if chased by a fiend. It would be found that a boy had been slipped into the front door, often with no warning phone call, and a new problem had been put on David Will's plate. Perhaps the boy had done no more than burn down a haystack 
or obstruct a railway line. But these things were frowned on in the phase of war around Dunkirk and the knife edge of outcome. What part did I play? Well, this is where I try and describe growing down. At first, in my weekly visits, I would see a boy or two give, her, give each a personal interview in which the most astonishing and revealing things would happen. I would sometimes get Dave and some of the staff to listen while I told the story of the interview in which I made smashing interpretations based on deep insight relative to material breathlessly presented by boys who were longing to get personal help but I could feel my little bits of sewing fall on stony ground. Rather quickly, I learned that the therapy was being done in the institution by the walls in the room, by the glass conservatory, which provided a target for bricks, by the absurdly large bass. The therapy was being done by the cook, by the regularity of the arrival of food on the table, by the warm enough and perhaps warmly colored bedspreads, by the efforts of David to maintain order in spite of a shortage of staff and a constant sense of the futility of it all because the word success belongs somewhere else. Of course, the boys ran away. They stole from the houses in the neighborhood and they kept breaking glass. The sound of breaking glass took on an epidemic proportion Fortunately, the champagne rhubarb was a long way away towards the west where the exhausted members of the staff could stand in the quiet and watch the sunset. Now, Donald's experience with David Wills uh, nearby in Oxfordshire was undoubtedly a mirror image of his experience with working with Claire with the hostels in Oxfordshire. It was the similar children similar era, similar location, and a similar drama. The work, the clinical experience himself was transformative. Interpretation was no longer at the core of the therapeutic process. Trust, reliability, holding, and survival had moved to the forefront. Of course, the personal relationship with Claire was deeply significant for Donald. Her mirroring and holding certainly enhanced his productivity. But while romance and eros stimulate our analytic imaginations, this relationship emerged from Donald's collegial partnership with a talented and in many ways quite brilliant woman with whom he could explore the interplay between external and internal reality. As Claire noted, we played with ideas tossing them about at random with the freedom of knowing that we need not agree and that we were strong enough not to be hurt by each other. Development of our person, professional selves does not merely emerge from our personal history, be it childhood trauma or adult romance. It also requires an interplay of ideas, exposure to new experiences, and ongoing evaluation of clinical practice. All of these factors were evident in the Winnicott's relationship. Decades ahead of their colleagues in both social work and psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis, Claire and Donald's used clinical data rarely found in psychoanalysis proper to explore how facilitating environments enhance maturational processes. This integrative approach challenges us today as many practitioners are more comfortable focusing either on the environment or the psyche, but not both together. The creative partnership of Claire, Winter, Claire Brenner, Britton and Donald Winnicott left a rich legacy of clinical observations, hypotheses, and techniques that encompass the complex interplay of both the inner and outer realities in social work, psychoanalytic practice in everyday life. Thank you very much. Bom, muito obrigado, professor Joel, por, por essa conferência tão generosa, é, que a gente pode aprender tanto pela Claire e também é, ter um, outras perspectivas do, do Donald Winnicott. Muito obrigado mesmo. E agora eu gostaria de passar a palavra para o professor Gilberto Safra, 
que eu acho que todos já conhecem, a maioria deve conhecer, que é professor no Departamento de Psicologia Clínica da Universidade de São Paulo e autor de diversos livros, diversos trabalhos sobre o Donald Winnicott. Então, gostaria de convidá-lo, professor, para seguir com seus comentários. Muito obrigado pela disponibilidade. Bem, muito obrigado a todos. Obrigado ao Pablo pelo convite de poder estar aqui com vocês, é, participar e aproveitar é, da conferência feita pelo Jaúa. É, eu comentava né, com o Pablo que, pouco antes aqui da, da conferência, que eu havia tido a oportunidade de conhecer os trabalhos de Jaúa sobre Clário Winnicott, anos atrás, talvez cerca de uns oito, nove anos atrás, quando eu era professor da Pontifícia Universidade Católica, e quando então, como parte das pesquisas, os estudos que nós realizávamos naquela época, tivemos a oportunidade de aproveitar é, de maneira bastante fecunda é, os trabalhos do professor Joe e dos artigos que, de alguma forma, ele também foi disponibilizando é, a fim de que nós pudéssemos conhecer mais profundamente o trabalho da Clara. Assim, eu agradeço ao professor Joey, não só pela conferência de hoje, mas agradeço também por todo o trabalho realizado ao longo dos anos em tornar é, conhecido é, a história, sim, da relação de Winnicott com Clare e também os trabalhos extremamente interessantes da Clara Winnicott. Né? É, espero, então, também que, a partir dessa conferência que nós tivemos a oportunidade de ter hoje, que, sim, se possa é, também ter os outros trabalhos do professor Joey, da Clara Winnicott, publicado entre nós, porque desde que eu tive, então, a oportunidade de conhecer mais profundamente o trabalho da Claire, para mim se tornou é, fundamental é, para o estudo de Winnicott conhecer mais profundamente o trabalho da Claire. Né? Eu acho que o professor Joey apresentou na sua conferência, aquilo que me parece que é, é uma síntese né, de todo o seu trabalho de pesquisa a, ao longo dos anos, justamente apresentando esta interface entre o trabalho de Winnicott e o trabalho de Claire. É, na conferência, né, hoje e também ao longo dos seus trabalhos, é, o professor Joe procura justamente assinalar essa cooperação mútua entre Winnicott e Claire. É, e, verdadeiramente, à medida que também eu tive a oportunidade de ir estudando o trabalho de Claire, eu fui me surpreendendo né, com a, o aparecimento de intuições clínicas, de dimensões conceituais que, às vezes, aparecia na obra de Winnicott e de Claire, é, às vezes simultaneamente, às vezes afastado por há algum tempo, alguns anos, ora é, no trabalho de um, ora no trabalho de outro. Né? E é muito interessante porque a gente pode perceber que, é, sim, não tiveram filhos, mas a obra, né? para mim, a obra de Winnicott e Claire é a obra de ambos. Né? É, é o grande filho. Por isso que eu acho que é muito importante no estudo de Winnicott poder conhecer também o trabalho de Claire. É, um dos aspectos interessantes, né, que também foi apresentado hoje na conferência, eu acho assim que é, o trabalho de Claire ajuda a poder conhecer em experiência o, um dos grandes temas da obra de Winnicott, que é o management. Né? A gente pode perceber que Claire, em seus trabalhos, ela, ela aponta... É, dimensões e princípios muito fundamentais 
daquilo que nós chamamos de management, o manejo da situação clínica, manejo que, como o Ínico aqui apresentou em seus trabalhos, ele apontava né, o manejo como um dos dispositivos clínicos mais fundamentais com certos tipos de pacientes. O interessante é que o mundo, desde a morte de Winnicott até, até hoje, sofreu inúmeras transformações. Né? E, hoje, e hoje, em meio à pandemia, com toda a situação que nós estamos vivendo, mais e mais se reconhece que a clínica contemporânea demanda muito da perspectiva do manejo, do management, que Winnicott apresentou e que, Clara demonstrou em experiência através dos seus escritos e o Joe apresentou alguns tópicos fundamentais né, desse management na conferência de hoje. Em outros artigos do Joe, ele apresenta outras facetas muito interessantes. Eu queria pensar alguns elementos. né? É, por exemplo, essa, essa dimensão importante né, em que o assistente social e, muitas vezes, o clínico contemporâneo é, necessita, assim ocupar esse lugar de articulador da história, de articulador das narrativas, né, para manter uma história, de alguma forma, preservada, não só diante da dificuldade que um determinado paciente tem, mas diante da situação que nós vivemos historicamente hoje, né, de várias rupturas, de várias especializações, e uma das coisas importantes é que, de fato, o, o analista, o terapeuta, possa ser aquele que, de algum modo, integra as diferentes narrativas num todo coerente, dimensão fundamental da, do, da possibilidade de uma constância, de uma integração, e como Clara apresentou e que o Joey enfatizou, na possibilidade de ofertar o holding, a sustentação. Né? Também foi apontado é, pelo Jonah, através da conferência, a importância, né? muitas vezes em situações drásticas, desse ambiente que sobrevive, né? desse ambiente que possa suportar as diferentes rupturas. Né? Um dos tópicos né? que me pareceu também muito interessante, que eu fui podendo é, conhecer é, através da obra de Claire, como foi apresentada para o Joey. Por exemplo, tem um, um, um outro, uma outra dimensão que Claire aponta de uma maneira muito interessante, que é o que ela chama de objetos intermediários, muito próximo né, da questão dos objetos transicionais, e que nas situações difíceis, a Claire utilizava o tricô, dirigia o carro, né? o uso de objetos intermediários a fim de poder lidar com uma situação de profunda crise, profunda tensão, buscando aquilo que ela chamava de uma, de uma situação de certa neutralidade para que a comunicação significativa pudesse acontecer. Me pareceu sempre muito interessante este, este tipo de procedimento muito aparentado com os objetos transicionais, aquilo que ela chamava de objeto intermediário. Então, a dimensão do management, eu acho que se pode aprender muito através do estudo da obra de Claire. E tem um outro tema que, para mim, é muito caro por reconhecer a sua importância também no mundo contemporâneo. É, é, uma das minhas preocupações no estudo da obra de Winnicott entre nós foi é, enfatizar a importância de um conceito que, para mim, me parece fundamental na obra de Winnicott, que aparece quando ele descreve né, os casos de tendências antissociais, que ele ap apresenta o que ele chama de placement. Né? Infelizmente, nas traduções dos nossos textos em português, o placement desapareceu como conceito, né? o que é uma lástima, né? porque o placement como uma possibilidade de procedimento interventivo, né? é de alta valia, é de extremamente fecundo em muitos casos. Né? A gente pode observar, por exemplo, esse placement, né? algumas vezes apresentado para o Márcio de Cam, em alguns, algumas intervenções que ele pode fazer, 
Mas a gente vê também nos trabalhos de Claire, né? através das experiências que o Joio nos apresentou, com as crianças que precisavam desses lares substitutos. É, elementos muito importantes, princípios fundamentais na constituição de um placement. Né? É, há coisas assim muito interessantes, muito fecundas nessa dimensão do placement, também apresentado por Claire. É, por exemplo, uma, uma das dimensões que ela vai chamar de, de é, situação transicional. Tem um caso clínico, né? também foi apresentado, não na conferência, mas num dos textos do Joe, sobre o caso Kevin, né? onde a, 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 a Clara é, lida com o rapaz falando de uma situação transicional, né? de um ambiente em que o rapaz precisava estar nessa situação transicional e ela discute isso com o rapaz né, como um elemento fundamental do processo clínico do rapaz. Ela sai também com uma outra perspectiva extremamente interessante e fecunda, né, que é a, a participação transicional de pessoas ou do próprio terapeuta né, dentro da situação clínica. É, perspectiva interessante para o placement, perspectiva interessante da... da de, desse procedimento clínico muito utilizado entre nós aqui no Brasil, que é o acompanhamento terapêutico. Né? É, então, é, são, são elementos muito significativos, ou ainda, no mundo contemporâneo, a perspectiva em que Clara vai chamar a atenção, né? a partir do trabalho da assistente social, mas que a gente já percebe numa interface com a psicanálise, quando ela vai chamar a atenção que algumas situações né, é, é importante a participação do terapeuta no, na rede das relações interpessoais do paciente fora do consultório, fora da situação. Muito interessante. Né? A gente vai tendo, então, é, é, elementos, princípios, conceitos apresentados clinicamente, apresentados pela experiência que ela vai nos apontando, onde sim a gente pode perceber uma possibilidade de realização de uma atividade clínica, não só né, na situação tradicional do consultório, mas vamos dizer o seguinte, numa atividade clínica sustentada no espaço potencial que vai a campo, que vai para a vida, né, se utilizando, sim, dos conceitos de Winnicott, mas das profundas intuições de Clara, a fim de poder é, verdadeiramente realizar uma clínica sintônica com as necessidades que nós temos na atualidade. né? Assim como o Joe nos apresentou aquele momento é, de crise, né? É, da guerra, em que as crianças precisavam, sim, ser deslocadas em outras situações. Nós temos que essas duas figuras, Winnicott e Claire, uma profunda sensibilidade e compreensão ao sofrimento humano, puderam utilizar aquele momento difícil para aprender, para desenvolver possibilidades clínicas, né? estendendo tanto a psicanálise quanto o próprio serviço social numa dimensão para além, e que não só apresentaram, então, princípios muito interessantes sobre o processo clínico, né? mas também é, a, quanto à possibilidade de se criar situações clínicas fecundas para situações é, que se enfrenta a cada momento na vida. Né? Enquanto eu via a conferência do Joe, eu pensava, poxa, nós também estamos nesse momento, né? numa situação limite, né? onde as pessoas estão sofrendo privação, onde as pessoas também estão sofrendo a falta de desta possibilidade né, da perda de conexões, de narrativas, quantos avós, quantos pais, quantos filhos não estão precisando receber alguma coisinha, alguma coisa que pode ser né, entregue para que se possa criar, é, manter o vínculo de continuidade. Então, há, é, nesse momento também que nós estamos vivendo, momento histórico, um momento muito fértil, 
para sim aproveitar é, plenamente o pensamento de Winnicott, é, adentrar a contribuição de Clara, que me parece extremamente fecunda, para se poder pensar é, nas situações difíceis que nós estamos vivendo hoje. E, para finalizar, eu queria só apontar também mais um, um elemento que me pareceu muito interessante no, no trabalho clínico psicanalítico da Claire. Né? Sempre me interessou é, conhecer um pouco nos diferentes psicanalistas o que é para esse psicanalista o ponto fundamental em que a sua atenção está focada na condução da análise. É a destrutividade com a Melanie Klein? Né? É a constituição do self? É o desejo, a sexualidade? E uma das coisas que me pareceu muito interessante no trabalho da Claire, e que eu acho que é muito marcado pelas situações que ela pôde testemunhar, em que Claire coloca como elemento central na atenção do analista, como o paciente vive o luto. Como o paciente vive o luto em cada situação de vida, reconhecendo que a maturação, que o desenvolvimento de cada ser humano acontece, sim, por progressões e por lutos sucessivos. Né? Claire chama atenção, por exemplo, para a importância de observar de que maneira o paciente lida com os lutos dentro da análise. Né? E é muito bonito né? a maneira como, então, o Joe terminou a conferência nesse lindo trecho é, de Winnicott, em que o Winnicott também se prepara né? nesse crescer para baixo para poder se despedir. E é, eu recomendo a vocês a leitura de um texto belíssimo da Claire, escrito após a morte de Winnicott. Né? um texto belíssimo que é parte da elaboração do luto dela é, pela morte de Winnicott, em que ela tem esse sonho, os, os dois tomando um café da manhã, né, e ela conversando com Winnicott né, e perguntando ao Winnicott, bom, está tudo muito bem, mas tem alguma coisa estranha. E o Winnicott responde no sonho, sim, eu já estou morto. Né? É muito, muito interessante, muito bonito, e a gente percebe a coerência né, do trabalho da Claire nessa perspectiva de reconhecer e de lidar com os lutos sucessivos da vida e, claro, os lutos decorrentes né, da, das situações de crise que todos nós passamos e que a humanidade vai passando. Então, eu quero novamente agradecer ao Pablo, ao Gustavo, a toda a turma do Pablo que está organizando, especialmente ao Joey, pela conferência é, fecunda, por abrir esta possibilidade de que aqui os analistas brasileiros, os psicólogos brasileiros, possam conhecer essa interface fecunda de Clara e Winnicott, esperando que o Joey possa estar conosco outras vezes e que é, os seus trabalhos, os seus livros possam ser publicados aqui em português. Muito obrigado. Depois eu mando a referência do texto. Yeah, thank you, professor. I, one year ago, when the pen in March 2020, when the pandemic began, I I immediately thought of the story of the Winnicotts at a time of national crisis. Um, and, and I thought immediately, like of all the separations between people that they had during the war with families being separated. And at the same time, so many families today where you know people could not uh children cannot see their grandparents grandparents cannot see their children uh 
uh, adults could not see their aging parents. There was so many separations. Fortunately, you know, in the United States with the vaccine, we are more advanced, I think, than Brazil. So this is all changing very quickly in the past two months. Ele agradece ele agradece ao professor Gilberto Safra e diz que ele justamente pensou há um ano atrás, quando começou a pandemia, nessa situação é, é, da Claire e do Donald Winnicott é, durante a guerra e nesse afastamento das pessoas que o isolamento social colocava, é, 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 netos dos, dos avós, dos pais, né? Que agora, é, bom, nos Estados Unidos a vacinação está mais, mais avançada, né? Então ele entende que está que, que se mudando, mas que ele pensou exatamente isso. And, and even uh, Queen Elizabeth, at the beginning of April in, 19, in 2020, uh, made a statement connecting the events today with the events in 1940. And she recalled uh, the Queen when she was 14 years old. She gave a talk on the BBC uh, radio to England to help people deal with these separations and the children who are apart from families and families, parents apart from children. And the connection felt very real to her at that time. Rainha Elizabeth, ano passado, lembrou é, também desses eventos da guerra em comparação com os eventos da pandemia, quando, quando ela tinha 40 anos durante a guerra, falou no rádio sobre esses eventos de separação das famílias, das crianças, dos pais, em função da guerra, e que para ela essa conexão com o momento presente é muito real. Now, you know, we are very fortunate to have, you know, telephone, Zoom, uh, contact, uh, none of this they had in 19, uh, 1940, uh, but we still, and I imagine that many of you are seeing patients with, you know, Zoom or video uh, today. Uh, but last week, for the first time in 14 months, I went to my office and I saw patients with the vaccine uh, in my office for the first time in 14 months. And we begin to think about this experiment of what does it really mean to be in the physical presence of another person. É, claro que nós agora temos Zoom e vemos pacientes à distância, mas semana passada ele foi para o consultório dele, depois de 14 meses separados, reencontrar os pacientes e começaram a pensar é, sobre esse experimento de ver as pessoas presencialmente. Oh, so this is, these things now... I think uh, Professor uh, Gilberto is your name. Did I say that right? Yes, Gilberto. Uh, you know, it sounds like you read my paper on Beyond Psychotherapy uh, and where I talk about transitional participant, correct? Yes, which is my word, not Claire's word. Um, and the importance of how, you know, we have the transitional object of the possession that goes from one person to the other, but we think about the connection of people, actual people who convey our life experience. Uh, one of the most important things about this is we think about our siblings who lived they lived the childhood with us and those relationships are very important in our lives because the siblings know our parents and it's very important to be with people who actually lived next to us in life um, which this is very different than a psychotherapist who only hears the story of the patient's life. Um, can you? 
Sim, é, então ele confirma que o, o Gilberto estava pensando num capítulo dele, chamado Além da, da Psicoterapia, em que ele, Joel, introduz o conceito de participante transicional. Né? Esse conceito de participante internacional, inter, é, é, transicional, é, ele faz uma comparação com a ideia dos irmãos. Quer dizer, os irmãos têm os mesmos pais que a gente, acompanham a nossa vida, de algum modo tem aí nosso, a, a nosso percurso de vida acompanhado por eles, muito diferente... De, de, de um analista que a gente só vê em alguns momentos, né? Now, in, cl in clinical practice, even in my private practice, if I have adult patient who goes to hospital uh, for depression or psychosis, I try to visit the patient even one time in the hospital. Uh, mesmo? And then when they come out of the hospital, uh, I maybe can talk a little bit about the experience. Or if I see a child in, in psychotherapy, often I try at least one time to visit the school with the child. And I, maybe I sit in the class even for 15 minutes uh, and the child sees me in the class the child sees me talking to the teacher. Also, of course, the child sees me talking to the parents. Uh, and this is important in my mind. This is something I learned from Claire uh, in terms of uh, the significance of being present through parts of the person's life experience. É, mesmo nos pacientes que ele atende no consultório, se tem um paciente que, tem um, 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 que é internado por algum problema de saúde mental, ele dá um jeito de visitar essa pessoa no hospital pelo menos uma vez, e depois eles falam sobre isso no consultório. Quando ele atende criança, ele vai para a escola em algum momento, nem que seja para sentar 15 minutos na sala, e essa criança vê ele falando com o professor, vê ele falando com os pais dela, e que isso ele aprendeu com a Claire como algo importante né, no, no processo. Okay. Do we have questions from the group or comments? Então, agora vamos abrir para algumas questões. Gente, a gente tem pouco tempo, tem no YouTube. Eu estou vendo aqui mãos levantadas. Eu vi o Leopoldo. A Marina tinha colocado uma, uma mão antiga. Você quer falar, Marina? Quer fazer uma pergunta ou foi um? Eu acho que deve ter, acho que ela nem sabe que está com a mão levantada. Leopoldo, quer fazer uma, uma pergunta? Ah, é, em primeiro lugar, eu queria agradecer a este evento, a possibilidade de ouvir Joel é, comentando. Eu já havia Sim. lido o livro dele sobre Face to Face with é, Children, é muito interessante, enfim, um material muito rico. E é um prazer estar aqui com, com você, e compartilhando essa possibilidade de diálogo, de início de diálogo. É, eu vou colocar no chat uma questão que eu... É, para te fazer, para ficar mais fácil, talvez, para a gente é, seguir. Mas é, e vou... É, não sei se... Então, é, 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 ler, se você quiser ler, eu traduzo, ler, ler, pode, pode ler. Há um tema que tem me ocupado há alguns anos, que é a ontologia introduzida por Winnicott na psicanálise, especialmente a partir dos anos 60, onde a noção de ser e continuidade de ser, bem como a de verdadeiro e falso self, a de criar e encontrar o mundo, o self e os outros, nos fenômenos transicionais, que todos juntos parecem ter uma proximidade muito grande com os fundamentos de uma psicologia fenomenológica e da psicologia existencialista, especialmente as noções de dazen, de encontro, de autenticidade. Nessa direção, é, nós encontramos, eu encontrei muito pouco da biblioteca de Winnicott referências desse tipo. E pensando no encontro amoroso, intelectual e profissional de Claire Winnicott, é, me veio que a, essa perspectiva humanista dos dois 
talvez tenha se intensificado, seja pela relação amorosa, seja pelo encontro, seja pelo encontro mútuo, que possibilitou a inserção desses conceitos ou desses mais fenômenos que conceitos que dizem respeito ao ser, o encontro, o estar com, né? E isso me parece um ponto de mudança significativo para toda a psicanálise e para o entendimento tanto da obra de Claire quanto de Winnicott. Então, nesse sentido, eu creio que Joel tem acesso ou teve acesso às suas pesquisas ao material que nós não temos acesso e, além disso, é, pela inteligência e sensibilidade de seu texto, possivelmente ele se deparou com questões, é, se não conceituais, fenomenológicas, que têm a ver com esse tema. Oi. Can you hear me ok? Sim. Yes. Sim. Yes. Um... One thing, I don't think uh, Donald, I don't think he read very much. Um, and, you know and, I don't think, and I don't think he read philosophy. Um, the, the, the second thing I would say, so philosophers read Winnicott I don't know if Winnicott read philosophy. Então ele começa dizendo que não sabe, que ele acha que o Donald Winnicott não lia muito e não lia muito filosofia, que uh -huh. os filósofos que estão lendo Donald Winnicott e não o contrário. Um, and language, clarity of language was very important to Claire. Uh, she she did not in her teaching she did not use the term transitional object in her teaching she used the term first <coughs> first treasured possessions and é, então a, a claire tinha é, a, a clareza da linguagem era uma coisa muito importante para ela por exemplo, ela não falava em objeto transicional nos, nas suas aulas, ela falava em first treasured object, o primeiro objeto amado, né? Tintesourado. Processão preciosa. Processão, obrigado, Gustavo. Eu acho que é a primeira processão preciosa. And, seu, seu yeah. and, and, and she, she joked with people about Donald's, what she would look at as the Donald's pretentious use of language. E ela, ela tirava um sarro com as pessoas, brincava com o que ela via é, no Donald Winnicott como um uso pretencioso da linguagem. Uh, so, so, to think of the use of language, you know, in our world of academia and the use of language directly with the public. Um, one of my favorite stories when I did this research, I, in 1995, I went to a, to visit, uh, the woman, uh, retired who taught at the London School of Economics, who, whose husband had a, uh, small publishing house and published Claire's monograph. And we were, tr I was transported to the rail station by a working woman in the town. And I was introduced uh, saying, um, uh, this Joel Cantor is visiting and he is studying Dr. Winnicott, you know, Donald Winnicott. And this working woman said, oh, I met Donald, I met Dr. Winnicott. You want to translate this? Então, é, sobre essa diferença né, da linguagem acadêmica e da linguagem cotidiana, tem uma história que ele gosta, em 94, nas pesquisas dele, ele estava na Inglaterra e estava ali com, com uma pessoa ligada a edições, né, por, 
da, da London School, se eu compreendi bem, e aí uma, uma mulher né, trabalhadora foi levá-lo à estação de trem, e o, esse editor que estava com ele apresentou dizendo, olha, esse é um estudioso do trabalho do Donald Winnicott. E a mulher disse, ah, eu conheci o Donald Winnicott. So, I think, you know, I imagine no working person in the United States would know a name of a psychoanalyst, nor trouble to visit them. But she listened to uh, Donald's talks on the BBC radio, and she was very impressed. And she said to herself, I want to go meet this man. So she had a boy who was five years old, and she went on the train to London uh, with her boy. There was no problem with the boy. And she went to the Paddington Green Clinic to take her boy so she could meet Donald Winnicott. Now, I imagine, you know, it's like, what a special gift that a psychoanalyst can communicate so effectively with, you know, uneducated working people uh, uh, around, uh, around the country. There's, there's no, no other psychoanalyst I know who does this in the United States. Maybe you have this in Brazil. Uh, and she, I'm not going to tell the story, but she goes and she, she goes and to this clinic, everybody's in a big room. And Donald spends less than five minutes talking to her boy and says, uh, you know, your boy is very healthy. And the woman was very disappointed because she got very small amount of attention from uh, Dr. Whittacott. Uh, but he very quickly could tell her boy had no problem. But she enjoyed listening to him talk to everybody else in the room because you could hear it was all very public, the evaluations in the pediatric clinic. Muito bem. É, então, ele, ele, é, bom, ele acha que nos Estados Unidos não tem nenhum analista que se comunique assim com o público geral, com pessoas sem, sem, sem estudos formais, como o Winnicott, né? Essa mulher, ela, uh, ouvindo as falas do Winnicott na BBC, ela teve vontade de conhecê-lo. Então, ela pegou o trem, pegou o filho dela de cinco anos e levou para o Paddington Green, onde o Winnicott fazia essas consultas abertas, né? E é, esse menino não tinha nenhum problema. Ele chegou lá, né? É, o Winnicott conversou com, com esse menino por cinco minutos e disse, olha, você tem um rapaz muito, muito saudável, né? É, ela ficou um pouco desapontada, porque não, não, não teve muita atenção do Donald Winnicott, mas ficou lá prestando atenção, porque essas consultas eram públicas. Então, ela ouvia o que as conversas do Winnicott com as outras pessoas. Né? Então, ele fala, bom, talvez no Brasil vocês tenham algum analista que consiga comunicar-se assim publicamente, mas que nos Estados Unidos ele acha que não tem. Que coisa incrível, né? So this is not a good answer to the professor but i think one of our challenges in psychoanalysis is to communicate effectively with the whole community that we live in uh and both donald and claire had great effectiveness in doing this um claire, i should tell everybody claire was you know she's not known well Uh, in the, you know, not known at all in the United States and not known well in much of psychoanalysis. But in the world of social work in uh, Britain, she was very well known. Um, Bom, ele, ele é, sabe que não é uma, uma, exatamente uma resposta para o professor, né, para o Leopoldo, é, mas, enfim, ele acha muito importante essa habilidade dos analistas poderem se comunicar, que os dois eram muito bons nisso, que a Claire é, é, não, era, não é muito conhecida entre os psicanalistas, né, mas que é muito conhecida, é, ficou muito conhecida no serviço social. Ok. Do we have, do we have time for one more question? Or, uh... 
Yeah, I, I think we can just read a couple questions and then you you comment them as a whole, okay? okay. Então a gente poderia ler algumas perguntas que vieram do YouTube, se tiver alguma coisa no chat aqui também, e, e a gente lê todos os comentários e ele faz é, considerações finais, tudo bem? A gente avança um pouquinho no tempo. É, Marina, pode ler? Vou ler então. É, uma pergunta que foi feita aqui no YouTube foi... Como podemos fazer um paralelo da situação de guerra com a da pandemia, do que afeta as crianças com perdas de contatos sociais para além da família? Marina, tem mais? Leia todas e, e dos comentários do, do Google Meet também, por favor. Tá. Tem mais uma. É, uma fala, a outra fala assim. Uma das ideias que mais me encantou foi a fala de Claire assinalando a importância do terapeuta prestar atenção aos sinais de vida no paciente. Podemos pensar que aceitamos ser guardiões desses sinais para podermos oferecê-los de volta quando o paciente deles precisar ao viver o luto e a elaboração das perdas? Poder oferecer presença para acolher a perda? Continue. Até o momento, essas foram as, as duas questões colocadas. Nós temos muitos agradecimentos, muitos elogios, mas de questão nós temos essas duas. Marina, por favor, leia no chat do Google Meets também. Ah, tem, tem um, um comentário aqui, recém colocado, que eu não tinha visto, mas é mais um comentário do que uma questão em relação ao papel do psicólogo jurídico nas adoções, também deveria cumprir essa necessidade de continuidade na vida das crianças e adolescentes em processo de adoção. Digo que o psicólogo segura na mão, segura na mão da criança e a conduz aos pais adotivos e pode integrar essa experiência atual com o período anterior que passa no abrigo do acolhimento. Então, agora, os comentários finais do Joel sobre essas questões. So, Joel, please, can you? Yeah, it's muted. Okay. Um, the, I, I love the passage about the signs of life in the person, and we, we uh, very... Much, much, some of this is going to be published in this article next year. Um, but I also think one person who has talked about a similar idea is the self-psychology analyst from Chicago, Marianne Tolpin, M-A-R-I-A-N, Tolpin, T-O-L-P-I-N. She has a concept called forward edge transference. You can find this on PepWeb. And, um, and, and my, my uh, thinking of this, I always think of the little plant coming out from the ground, from the seed. And, you know, the, you have to be very gentle with this little plant, with the signs of life. You can't put too much water on the plant or you kill the plant, or too little water, and the plant dies. And there's um, uh, the description that Claire had in the boy uh, who could not play, I thought was very good. 
with the foster mother who just sits there uh, quietly reading and knitting, does not make a lot of interpretations, but allows the boy to find himself. It's such a good description of, of perhaps how you approach, approach this. É, então, ele gosta muito dessa passagem de ficar atento aos sinais de vida, né, que foi mencionada. É, tem um artigo ano que, que vai sair que tem alguns elementos sobre isso, mas, de todo modo, ele falou de uma analista americana, Mary Topon, que fala de um conceito de uma transferência para frente, que teria a ver com isso, é, é, que vocês podem se interessar, né, ele tem uma imagem que ele acha muito útil, que é a, uma pequena semente germinando. É, esses casos, você não pode pôr nem muito, muita água, nem muito pouca água, né? Tem que deixar ali com um cuidado. E aí ele remete a Claire, com o um caso da criança que não, não brincava, como um processo que tinha poucas interpretações, né? Um processo de acompanhamento aí que teve essa, essa gentileza, esse, esse cuidado. Um, help thinking about helping the children with the ties. Uh, you know, um, I don't know, you know, one of the, I think things we're learning with the pandemic is that maybe at least that it is safe to meet people outside and maybe uh, if people think about this, you know, to, where families can uh, meet uh, in outside places uh, sometimes in a safe way that children can meet uh, uh, parents Uh, grandparents, sometimes families, uh, two families, three families get together who are safe with each other and uh, allow the children to play with each other. Uh, but, um, you know, it's it's a real challenge and how, how we are going to look at this for children after the pandemic stops. Uh, I have been very lucky because uh, my niece bought the house next to ours um, one year ago. And she lives, the niece and nephew live there with their two boys, age two and age three, who we see almost every day. And uh, it was a very helpful to them to have the family connection uh, with uh, We were, we were almost like grandparents through the year of the pandemic. Um, so we do what we can. It's impro impro improvise. Thank you. Anyhow, I'm going to have to stop because I have to go to work <laughs> and do my real work. <laughs> uh, That's great. So um, I'll just, can you wait for me translating or... Do you have to stop? Yes, you can translate. Ok. Yeah, I have. É, não, ele dizendo que essa questão da, dos laços das crianças, né, durante a pandemia, é realmente um grande desafio que a gente vai ter que lidar também depois da pandemia. Mas agora ele pensa em algumas coisas que, da própria experiência dele, né, é, de, de como é seguro se encontrar em espaços abertos, relativamente seguro, talvez algumas poucas crianças podendo brincar, como isso é importante para elas, né? E a própria experiência dele, que o sobrinho e a sobrinha se mudaram para próximo deles, com, e eles têm dois filhos, um de dois e um de três anos, e que durante o ano pandêmico eles se viram muitas vezes, e foram como que avós para essas crianças. E que a gente vai improvisando, fazendo o que pode. E aí ele diz que ele precisa sair, que ele tem um outro compromisso, né? Então, eu agradeço a todos, a todas, a participação, especialmente a Joel, ao professor Gilberto Safra, a Joel pela generosidade, pela, ele, ele fez um trabalho, é, preparou um texto em cima do que ele fazia, mas muito alinhado com conversas que a gente teve, 
né, um trabalho muito cuidado, agradeço a todos, espero que seja o primeiro contato de muitos que a gente possa ter, né, agradeço também a presença aqui dos colegas é, estudiosos de Winnicott, aqui vi o Leopoldo, vi Rosa é, Tosta, vi uh, algumas outras pessoas que não vou poder nomear agora, mas muito contente com todos. So I thank you very much, Joel, thank the colleagues here, and I really hope that's just the beginning of a fruitful connection. Actually, not okay. exactly the beginning. People already know your work, but it's a new step okay. on an ongoing relationship. Thank, thank you. you very much. Very good. A great pleasure. Thank you. Okay.